Welcome to Lecture 3 on Huck Finn. William Dean Howells, the editor of The Atlantic, saw realism largely as a type of documentary art. It was a way to present an accurate vision of American life to those living overseas and to preserve that vision of contemporary American life for later generations. It was also a way for Americans to understand various geographic cultures within the growing United States. Through realism, readers in Boston might understand life in the Far West, such as in Nevada or California. Likewise, readers in New York might understand the lifestyles of people with a Creole or Cajun background living in or around New Orleans. Likewise, readers in Louisiana might then understand the tensions and opportunities of New York City by reading works of American realism set there. Realism was also a way to depict the pluralities of geographic culture within the country. Writers, in effect, stood in as spokespeople for one or at most two regions. The author, Kate Chopin, became a literary ambassador through her fiction for life in New Orleans. Jack London became a literary ambassador for the experience of Americans living in the far western part of the country. Mary Wilkins Freeman became a literary ambassador for rural New England. Their fiction was written in such a way as to translate and explain the customs and traditions of one region to an audience that was living in a different region. This was called regionalism, in which literary works represented the culture of one region. But beyond presenting and preserving a more accurate version of American life, many authors saw another social value inside of realism. Part of this has to do with a belief about art that we mostly no longer believe today. Realists believed that they were able to objectively examine the world around them and, through language as much as they were able, produce a reasonable facsimile of it on the page. If an author was gifted, the version of American life presented on the page would have a similar mix of tensions, yearnings, conflicts, disappointments, and satisfactions that one found in actual American communities. If the version on the page represented actual American life, then an author could explore how to correct social problems within the pages of a novel. Let's take a contemporary example to understand how this might work. Let's say that there's an author who wants to write a novel of realism about the plight of homeless people. And I should put this qualifier up front. It's not possible for a work of literary realism to be written in the way it was in the 1800s for reasons we'll discuss in a later lecture. But for right now, let's put that concern aside. Let's say that there's an author who is going to write about the plight of a long-term homeless community. And as part of this novel, the author would like to explore barriers that exist toward bringing this homeless community into employment. In a novel of realism, so long as the author accurately understands the characters and the situation, the work of fiction should then create a document that identifies the most significant barriers that people in this community would face while trying to re-enter employment. A novel like this could then be used as a teaching tool to identify and remove barriers in the real world. Such a novel could also be used to create empathy and understanding for people who are homeless and the struggles they face re-entering the workforce. Again, using this type of fiction... All of this diagnostic work could be accomplished on the page rather than in actual social situations. But from our post-Freud 21st century perspective, there are clear limitations and blind spots with this approach to using fiction as a means of diagnosing and understanding social problems with an eye toward improving society. But this exact construction underpins a good deal of American fiction produced during the period of realism. In this novel, Mark Twain wants to create a character whose life from an early age has been influenced by some of the most vile forms of racism in America. And then this novel wants to ask the following two questions. What would it take to change a young person raised in this environment? And after being inculcated with this type of cultural racism at a young age, how much could this character change under ideal circumstances? Or to put this in straightforward terms, 
Huck has been raised in a racist environment. The people around him have racist views, and his father in particular has extremely racist views. What would it take for Huck to unlearn perspectives that he's absorbed from others? And how much unlearning is possible now that Huck is moving into his early teen years? From this perspective, the racism in the novel is not only a depiction of American life in the 1840s, it is part of the central experiment that Twain is engaging. Twain is showing us how racism is passed from generation to generation. Children absorb the worldview they are given. Twain is also allowing us to see the depth of racism presented specifically to Huck. So when the literary experiment begins, events guiding Huck to undo his racist worldview, we understand the depth of that worldview and how it was arranged in Huck in the first place. The following passage is from chapter six. It contains some of the most difficult language and deepest racism in the entire book. But remember, this is central to the book's mission. We need to see first what ideas framed Huck's worldview so we can better understand how or even if it can be undone. Oh, yes. This is a wonderful government. Wonderful. Why, looky here. There was a free nigger there from Ohio, a mulatter, most as white as a white man. He had the whitest shirt on you ever see, too, and the shiniest hat. <laughs> and there ain't a man in that town that's got as fine clothes as what he had. And he had a gold watch and chain and a silver-headed cane, the awfulest old gray-headed nabob in the state. And what do you think? He said he was a professor in a college and could talk all kinds of languages and knowed everything, and that ain't the worst. They said he could vote when he was at home. <laughs> well, that let me out. Thinks I, what is a country a coming to? In this previous section, Pap moves through a racist rant in which he describes that, in his view, a society should be arranged as a hierarchy based on race rather than on talent or accomplishments. Though Pap represents an extreme racist view in this novel, the town is full of people who support slavery and have told Huck that the interior experience of people, the way they feel about the world, varies depending on racial background. As discussed in a previous lecture, Huck tends to accept the views of those who are older than him and those who have more education, until he can test those beliefs out for himself. And this here is the plot mechanism that drives the novel. On the one hand, the novel asks, can Jim, with Huck's help, free himself from slavery? And on the other hand, the novel asks if Huck, with Jim's help, can free his mind from the racist influence of the pre-war South. In the early sections of the novel, it's clear where Twain believed his novel was going. Huck would help Jim find literal freedom, and Jim would help Huck free his mind from the racist influences around him. The process of educating Huck, or of Huck unlearning damaging concepts he had previously absorbed, begins fairly early in the story. The first lesson that Huck receives from Jim, arranged again with some touches of humor, asks Huck to consider why some people have freedom and other people are seen as property, people to whom a dollar amount is fixed. Again, the lessons here are light, but they begin a larger discussion as the book moves forward. In this section of Chapter 8, Jim tells a story about how he has loaned out 10 cents to a friend who invested it in a church offering plate after the minister said that anyone who gave money or lent money to the poor would no doubt find that their money would be returned 100-fold. But Jim quickly learned that despite his friend Balaam's so-called investment, he wasn't getting any money back. Nothing came of it, Jim said, and I couldn't manage to collect that money no way. And Balaam, he couldn't. And I ain't going to lend no more money without I see the security. 
Bound to get your money back a hundred times, the preacher says. If I could get the ten cents back, I'd call it square and be glad of the change. Well, it's all right anyway, Jim, long as you're going to be rich again sometime or other. Yes, and I's rich now. Come to look at it, I owns myself, and I's worth $800. I wish I had the money. I wouldn't want no more. And it is that last part, how Jim is forced to see himself as a commodity, as something with a fixed value far different from how Huck sees himself, that Twain is beginning to wedge into the materials of this novel. One of the next sections in which Huck is educated by Jim comes in chapter 14. Huck and Jim are having a discussion about what separates Americans from the French. But the subtext here is something of greater weight. What separates white people in America from African Americans? Huck presents the idea that people have differences based on where they're from. But then Jim presents the idea that the correct way to look at all humanity is that people are essentially the same and they should be viewed that way. Again, there's humor here. But in this section, again, Twain is starting to place larger ideas into the novel. I'll pick up the scene as Huck and Jim are discussing why French use language different than Americans. Shucks, Huck said, it ain't calling you anything. It's only saying, do you know how to talk French? Well then, why couldn't he say it? Why, he is a saying it. That's a Frenchman's way of saying it. Well, it's a blame ridiculous way, and I don't want to hear no more about it. There ain't no sense in it. Looky here, Jim. Does a cat talk like we do? No, a cat don't. Well, does a cow? No, a cow don't neither. Does a cat talk like a cow or a cow talk like a cat? No, they don't. It's natural and right for them to talk different from each other, ain't it? Course. And ain't it natural and right for a cat and a cow to talk different from us? Why, most surely it is. Well then, why ain't it natural and right for a Frenchman to talk different from us? You answer me that. Is a cat a man, Huck? No. Well then, there ain't no sense that a cat talking like a man. Is a cow a man or is a cow a cat? No, she ain't neither of them. Well then, she ain't got no business to talk like either one of them. Is a Frenchman a man? Yes. Well then, Dad blame it. Why don't he talk like a man? You answer me that. Just one chapter later, Jim becomes far more confrontational with Huck in terms of requiring him to see the world from a different vantage point. In this sequence, Huck and Jim are traveling at night on the river lost in the fog. Jim is on the raft and Huck is in the canoe. They are looking for Cairo to take a ship up to the Free States, but they miss the city. We've talked about this section earlier in our lectures. Early American authors can at times use symbolic images in a heavy-handed way. For example, in Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne, the main character is concerned about losing his religious faith, but he's also worried about losing his wife, who is also named Faith. There's nothing particularly subtle there. But Twain has a softer hand in terms of placing symbolic elements into his stories. In this sequence, Huck is by himself as the fog comes down around him, and because of the fog, he doesn't know how to proceed forward. Let me ask you this. In the 1840s, how many colors does fog come in? I know now you go down to the rave and you can get purple fog. But back in the 1840s, how many colors did fog come in? Just one, right? You might think of it as ash or white or light gray. So if there's just one color of fog, why does Twain go out of his way repeatedly to tell us that Huck is lost in the white fog? Not only the white fog, but the solid white fog. Twain here has found a moment where the actions in the drama mimic the underlying conceit of the novel. Here Huck is of course lost in the white fog on the river, but on a figurative level, Huck as a character is lost in a different type of solid white fog. The fog of whiteness or of being Caucasian, the white fog of the Old South, the fog of white values, and so on. 
And in terms of symbolism, the book is suggesting that this whiteness is causing Huck to lose his way, to be unable to see the world around him with clarity. This is from chapter 15. As soon as I got started, I took out after the raft, hot and heavy, right down the towhead. That was all right as far as it went, but the towhead weren't 60 yards long, and the minute I flew by the foot of it, I shot out into the solid white fog, and I had no more idea which way I was going than a dead man. In terms of a symbolic read, the novel is asking the question, What will it take for Huck to see the world around him with clarity, to leave the blinding whiteness that is pervasive in this part of the country? And the novel begins to answer this question when Huck returns to the raft. Huck initially plays a trick on Jim, telling him that many of the events he remembered were part of a dream. Once he convinced Jim of this dream, He then pointed to the debris on the floor of the raft so that Jim would feel foolish once he realized that he had been duped. But this goes poorly for Huck. It had clouded up pretty dark just after I got onto the raft, but it was clearing up again now. There's our first signal. The cloud of whiteness figuratively is about to be lifted as this scene moves forward. Oh, well, that's all interpreted well enough as far as it goes, Jim, I says. But what does these things stand for? It was the leaves and rubbish on the raft and the smash door. You could see them first rate now. Jim looked at the trash, and then looked at me, and back at the trash again. He had got the dream fixed so strong in his head that he couldn't seem to shake it loose and get the facts back into its place again right away. But when he did get the thing straightened around, He looked at me steady without ever smiling, and says, "'What do they stand for? I's gwine to tell you. When I got all wore out with work and went to calling for you and went to sleep, my heart was most broke because you was lost, and then I didn't care no more what become of me or the raft. And when I wake up and find you back again all safe and sound, the tears come.' And I could have got down on my knees and kiss your foot, I so thankful. And all you was thinking about was how you could make a fool of old Jim with a lie. That truck there is trash, and trash is what people is that puts dirt on the head of their friends and makes them ashamed. What Jim is saying here is this. Huck, the people in St. Petersburg have given you one way to look at the world. Using this, they have told you who is on top and who is the trash at the bottom. But Huck, I'm going to give you a different way to view people. People should be judged by their actions. The people at the bottom of society are those who don't consider the feelings of their friends. They are people who amuse themselves by making fun of others. Huck, the world isn't arranged as pap sod. It's instead arranged around a sense of decency and mutual support. And in this other system, Huck, you are at the bottom of society. You are that trash. In this, Jim is inverting the system of social hierarchy that Huck has absorbed through Pap and others. Then he got up slow and walked to the wigwam and went in there without saying anything but that. But that was enough. It made me feel so mean I could almost kiss his foot to get him to take it back. This is the beginning of Huck's education. It's also the beginning of Mark Twain's education as well. It seems clear that early on Twain felt that his novel would have a strong character arc in which Huck overcame the racist views of his hometown and challenged ideas of slavery. But here's the other side of realism. Characters could only act in a plausible way in a book of literary realism. We've already discussed that Huck Finn was based on a person Mark Twain knew while he was growing up. As Mark Twain wrote the novel, in some form, he presented himself with this question. How would Huck respond in these moments if Huck were a real person? A person as real as Tom Blankenship, the boy Mark Twain knew when he was young. In the book, 
Huck Finn is starting to test the social belief system he absorbed from adults back home. But in writing this book, Mark Twain, as an author, is starting to understand how difficult it is for people to unlearn belief systems that they absorbed at a young age. Huck is about to apologize for his actions, but does he say that he humbled himself to Jim, or does he say that he humbled himself to a friend? No. He uses a word of property instead that clearly defines the difference between Huck and Jim. He was fifteen minutes before I could work myself up to go and humble myself to a nigger, but I done it, and I warn't ever sorry for it afterwards neither. I didn't do him no more mean tricks, and I wouldn't have done that one if I'd have known it would make him feel that way. In this, Mark Twain is starting to understand how difficult it will be for Huck to absorb the type of large change he had likely imagined for him at the start of the novel, as characters in a novel of realism must act in a way that corresponds to how people act in the real world. Mark Twain is starting to teach himself the difficulties of undoing a racist worldview when it has been absorbed at a young age. In terms of an ideal experience for change, it's not just that Huck and Jim are isolated on a raft. There's another important element here that is priming Huck for change, the type of change that feels like it contains a deep authenticity. And it's something that I think most college students can relate to. We don't know Huck's exact age. He's usually presented as either 12 or 13, but he's going through a life experience that many 18-year-olds encounter today. He's leaving home for the first time. So if you've left home and moved here to Cal Poly, you've probably gone through a type of behavioral separation from your home environment, one that most people find freeing. So back in September of your first year of college, your parents drove you in that powder blue minivan, or maybe it was a burgundy SUV, into the campus parking lot and then proceeded to unload boxes of stuff into your dorm room, probably more stuff necessary than to fill a three-bedroom apartment. And then once they realized how small a dorm room was, they put some of your stuff back in that minivan or SUV. Then they said goodbye, and then they drove home. And then you probably didn't see them for many weeks. You made friends, you went to class, probably had a lot of doubts about whether you'd chosen the right major. The first time most students go home is Thanksgiving break, about eight weeks in the fall quarter. It's been a while since I was in college, but usually what happens is this. You go home, you spend some time with your parents as they're helping with the school bills and all, and then you go out and see your friends. And you notice your friends, those that didn't go away to college, haven't changed at all since the previous summer. They're still doing the same dumb stunts, hanging out in the same houses. On Friday night, they take someone's pickup out to, well, depending on where you live, either the woods or the beach, where everyone has a couple of beers, then pretends to be far more drunk than they actually are. Then everyone goes to Denny's, where they order a bunch of side dishes like hash browns. While you and your friends are in the booth, you spend half your time talking to each other and half your time messaging people who aren't there to let them know what they're missing out on. When you're done, Everyone undertips the wait person and then arrives home around 1.30 in the morning. In other words, things back home haven't changed that much. And do you find it comforting or do you find it irritating that your friends haven't changed? Most people find it irritating that their old friends, the ones who stayed home, haven't changed. That's usually the day one impression during Thanksgiving break. And then hopefully... Later in the week, you have a second impression. The amazing thing here is not that your friends didn't change. After all, you were only gone for eight weeks. No one goes home and thinks, Mom, Dad, I'm so irritated that you're the same people you were last summer. It's only the peer group against which these observations are leveled. And then that second observation, hopefully you arrived at, is this that you've changed in profound and meaningful ways over a short period of time. Most freshmen have an experience somewhat like this. So now a question. 
What caused you to change in a way where those new aspects of your personality felt so authentic, even though the period of time over which they had been developed was only eight weeks? So think about that for a moment. What caused that change? Was it a new level of responsibility at college? Well, I know our dorms fairly well. I understand how they work. No one is exactly caring for themselves as adults in the dorms. Someone else takes care of all of the maintenance. Someone else services the appliances, such as the washing machines and dryers. Someone else is doing the yard work. And in terms of food, all you need to do is to show up at a certain building between certain hours to find food that someone else has prepared for you. So then, was it the classes? Well, true, the classes are more difficult than those in high school. But even the curriculum at high school had scaffolding to present a sequence in which the material became more difficult each year. Algebra led to geometry, which led to Algebra 2, which led to pre-calc, and so on. And the reading material for your senior level English class was hopefully more complex than the reading material you had for the class you took as a freshman. So what was it then exactly that produced this change? Though there may have been a number of influences, it was in large part this. You were behaviorally removed from a familiar environment. Parents and longtime friends put social pressure on you to act in a way that is consistent with your longtime identity. But if you move away from your family and friends, you can develop, deepen, or change your identity very quickly. When you're away from home, you feel like your new self because there's no one there to remind you who you used to be. And when you go back home, often for years, you may feel as though you are falling into a much younger version of yourself. For example, when you go home now and hang around with your family and friends, how long does it take for you to feel as though you are 17 or 18 years old again? The journey to establish your new adult self in the surroundings of your childhood home may take years, and that's okay, and that's what many people move through. But here in our novel, this is also what Huck is experiencing. He's not 18 years old. He's not a college freshman but he is away from his family and friends for the first time in his life. Here his personality is opening and expanding over a short period of time, just as yours did when you first came to college. Most everyone accepts the worldview they are given from parents or their community when they are young. At this point in Huck's life, he is beginning to examine if the belief system he was given matches how he sees the world. And again, maybe this is part of your experience in college as well. While these characters are on the river, we can see Huck's thought processes as he unlearns things that he had absorbed from his community. We can see this as he moves down river, and I'd like you to consider Huck's vantage point for the following passage. These are not racist observations that Huck is making. This is the moment-by-moment -moment experience of Huck challenging the racist worldview he'd received while growing up. This is from chapter 16. Jim talked out loud all the time while I was talking to myself. He was saying how the first thing he would do when he got to a free state, he would go to saving up money and never spend a single cent. And when he got enough, he would buy his wife, which was owned on a farm close to where Miss Watson lived. Then they would both work to buy the two children. And if the master wouldn't sell them, they'd get an abolitionist to go and steal them. It most froze me to hear such talk. He would not never dare to talk such talk in his life before. And this, a little later, is from chapter 23, so we can see how Huck's outlook is maturing. I went to sleep, and Jim didn't call me when it was my turn. He often done that. When I waked up just as daybreak, he was sitting there with his head down betwixt his knees, moaning and mourning to himself. I didn't take notice nor let on. I knowed what it was about. He was thinking about his wife and children way up yonder, and he was low and homesick because he had never been away from home before in his life. 
and I do believe he cared just as much for his people as white folks do for theirn. It don't seem natural, but I reckon it's so. He was often moaning and mourning that way nights when he judged I was asleep and saying, Poor little Elizabeth, poor little Johnny, it's mighty hard. I suspect I ain't ever gonna see you no more, no more. In this passage, you can see that comparison directly. Huck has been told by Papp and many others in St. Petersburg that race underpins how people experience the world. But here, through his own observation, he is privileging his own conclusion over those proposed by adults back home. He is rebuilding his worldview based on personal experience. And as before, this too is often part of the college experience. Are there things, for example, that you have personally observed in the world that don't match how people back home told you the world would work? And if so, whose voice in your head is louder? The voice tied to your own observations or the voice tied to authority figures from your youth? Twain is suggesting that this is part of the process, at least for Huck, of removing racism from the world, specifically rebuilding, or perhaps more accurately, partially rebuilding your worldview and value system based on your own observations and ideals in which you choose to believe, rather than by accepting the value system you were given wholly at birth. This is the concept of social progress, that each generation is able to improve itself a little over the previous generation. But it's a process that requires introspection, observation, openness, and reflection. By this point in the novel, Huck is starting to see Jim as someone who is co-equal to him, at least in terms of emotional and personal experience, though perhaps not in legal standing. These experiences prompt Huck to ask Jim about his family. Then Jim tells the story about how his daughter lost her hearing and his deep sense of grief and regret over it. At this point, we're moving towards some interesting social questions in the novel. Specifically, what has changed in terms of Huck's worldview and what hasn't? The high point of the novel is typically considered to be chapter 31, the point where Huck needs to decide which voice in his head is the loudest, the one attached to the belief system that he is developing for himself or the one attached to authority figures back home. This is chapter 31. Once I said to myself it would be a thousand times better for Jim to be a slave at home where his family was as long as he got to be a slave, and so I'd better write a letter to Tom Sawyer and tell him to tell Miss Watson where he was. But I soon give up that notion for two things. She'd be mad and disgusted at his rascality and ungratefulness for leaving her, and so she'd sell him straight down the river again. This section begins as Huck surveys his options. One of those options is to adhere to the authority voices in his youth to write this letter. And the other option is to follow the leadings of his new value system that he's been developing for himself based on his own observations to instead protect his friend. In this novel, this is the primary moral dilemma for Huck, an awakening where he must decide how deeply he can trust his own ideas. It is also an ethical test in which he decides if he should help Jim, even though there may be social consequences for him in doing so. <sighs> that was my fix exactly. The more I studied about this, the more my conscience went to grind in me, and the more wicked and low down and ornery I got to feeling. Twain is writing his novel in the 1870s and 1880s, before Sigmund Freud, before the development of psychology as a field of study. But Twain has some compelling ideas as to how the human mind works. Many people during Twain's time would have held the view that a person's conscience was a moral compass, something that told the person what was morally right and what was morally wrong. But Twain has a different view of this in his works. He frames the conscience as a set of values that a person develops at a very early age. 
Those things that a person is told are correct when they're a child, according to Twain, will always feel like the morally correct response. The conscience, in Twain's view, is not an absolute set of ethical guidelines. The conscience is instead malleable. It's formed and shaped when children are young. And this is one of the largest barriers, according to this novel, for changing a racist society. Those values that children receive when they are young will often feel like the right response, even when they can see that another response from the standpoint of observation holds a greater good. Twain is observing that it's very difficult to overcome this felt sense of right and wrong, which is one of the reasons that racist ideologies are so difficult to remove from a culture. In this, Huck feels as though he's wrestling with his conscience, but in Twain's view, he's wrestling with old authority voices, which feels to him like his conscience. And at last, when it hit me all of a sudden, that here was the plain hand of providence slapping me in the face and letting me know my wickedness was being watched all the time from up there in heaven, whilst I was stealing a poor old woman's nigger that hadn't ever done me no harm, and now was showing me there's one that's always on the lookout and ain't a going to allow no such miserable things to go only just so far and no further. I most dropped in my tracks I was so scared. Again, to consider this from Huck's perspective. In this novel, he repeatedly references a Protestant vision of the afterlife as a certainty. For him, this talk of hell is not hyperbole. He believes in the idea of hell. For him, there are long-term consequences for his actions. So again, Huck frames this question in the following way. Is his obligation primarily to help himself, or is it to help Jim? As we continue this passage, we'll watch as Huck moves through the process of making this decision. Mark Twain is placing irony here as well. Huck will feel as though he's turning against the teachings of religion when in fact he's embracing one of the New Testament's central dictums, to treat others as you'd like to be treated yourself, to help those around you. And again here, Twain is pointing out that the attitudes of those around the church are often different than the teachings central to the church's mission. But here we will watch as, step by step, Huck struggles away from the values of his hometown and cautiously, with a sense of fear, approaches new values constructed through his own observations. Well, I tried the best I could to kind of soften it up somehow for myself by saying I was brung up wicked, and so I weren't so much to blame. But something inside me kept saying, There was the Sunday school, and you could have gone to it, and if you'd have done it, they'd have learnt you there. That people that acts as I'd been acting about that nigger goes to everlasting fire. It made me shiver. And I about made up my mind to pray and see if I couldn't try to quit being the kind of boy I was and be better. So I kneeled down. But the words wouldn't come. Why wouldn't they? It weren't no use to try and hide it from him. Nor from me, neither. I knowed very well why they wouldn't come. It was because my heart weren't right. It was because I weren't square. It was because I was playing double. I was letting on to give up sin, but away inside of me I was holding on to the biggest one of all. I was trying to make my mouth say I would do the right thing and the clean thing and go and write to that nigger's owner and tell where he was. But deep down in me I knowed it was a lie, and he knowed it. You can't pray a lie. I found that out. Here is one way to look at character development inside of the novel. In many novels, characters are moved to a point where they can express who they really are. In this novel, it's wrapped up in the idea of prayer. Huck can't pray a lie. In the mindset of prayer, Huck can only express the truth of who he is. The novel has been pushing him to publicly express his inner truth, 
which will separate him from the other characters. Around Huck are frauds. The king and the duke conceal the truth of their being. They are con men who construct false personas to conceal their intentions so that they might profit off of others. Huck is struggling toward a type of authenticity. For him, that authenticity means that he needs to undo some of the damaging ideas he's absorbed earlier in his life. And to touch on a sub-theme in today's lecture, this is often part of the college experience, of being away from family, of being to some degree on your own. College, in addition to learning skills that will prepare you for life and a career, can also be about moving yourself over years to a point where you publicly speak the truth of who you are. And like Huck in this process, maybe there's a few steps forward followed by a couple back before you find inner confidence. Huck is at that point here, that point of inner conflict. From here, Huck, full of trouble, will write a letter to Miss Watson, but then with the letter beside him, the one that would send Jim back into slavery, he thinks again about the ideas inside of him. And got to thinking over our trip down the river, and I see Jim before me all the time, in the day and in the night time, sometimes moonlight, sometimes storms, and we are floating along, talking and singing and laughing. But somehow I couldn't seem to strike no places to harden me against him, but only the other kind. I'd see him standing my watch on top of his'n, instead of calling me so I could go on sleeping, and see how glad he was when I come back out of the fog. And when I come to him again in the swamp up there where the feud was, and such like times, and would always call me honey and pet me and do everything he could think of for me, and how good he always was, and at last I struck the time I saved him by telling the men we had smallpox aboard, and he was so grateful, and said I was the best friend old Jim ever had in the world, and the only one he's got now. And then I happened to look around and see that paper. It was a close place. I took it up and held it in my hand. I was a trembling because I'd got to decide forever twixt two things, and I knowed it. I studied a minute, sort of holding my breath, then says to myself, all right, then. I'll go to hell and tore it up. British fiction is often focused on a homogenous society arranged in a large city. But those ideas don't translate well onto an American canvas. In the 1800s, America, as Twain has pointed out, wasn't like England. America's central concerns were space and race, all of that land across the continent and how people will approach it, and the concept of racism, the evil that has followed America from its inception. Mark Twain has tried to create a novel that takes on these concerns, a novel that provides guidance for how Americans might undo racist ideologies by showing how this experience transforms Huck. This here is the moral high point of the novel, the point where Huck allows himself to help Jim, a decision that means that he turns away from the values he was presented with when he was young. In terms of the novel and its message, here is both the problem and the insight. Though it seems clear that Twain initially imagined a story in which Huck would overcome racism and challenge the concept of slavery, he's at the point in the story's development where, perhaps, he's considering how realistic it would be for the breadth of this change to happen in one person's life. In this, Twain is starting to understand, through the act of writing this novel, the complex problems of cultural racism, and is suggesting a different timeline to undo long-term damage, damage that initially he seems to have believed might have been undone, for Huck at least, on the river. And that, I think, those realistic markers for undoing the damage of racism through a process, is the novel's larger message for us today. And we will talk about that some in the next lecture. <laughs>